an ordinary country lane. And an ordinary car. Looks like this guy's having a bit of engine trouble. Poor chap, he's gonna need a push. Well, luckily, this lady is around to help. You look like you need a hand. She's going to push that car? That is amazing, Chris. It's a massive 4x4. Four four. It's way more amazing than that, Zond. Check this out. This is Anastasia, and her hair is so strong, she can, yes, even pull a car with it. Crazy, I know. Anastasia holds the world record for hanging weight from her hair, a hair-raising 53.4 kilograms. That's the equivalent of two average seven-year-olds hanging directly from her hair. So how does she do it? Well, human hair contains keratin. It's an incredibly strong protein. So tough, in fact, it's the same thing a rhinoceros horn is made of. Anastasia has learned to use the strength of her hair to pull massive cars like this. And it takes a lot of preparation. It takes 45 minutes. It takes two guys to plait their hair like a rope. Turning her hair into a rope ensures the weight of the car is evenly distributed across her head so that no hair is pulled out. But hair pulling is still an uncomfortable experience, so Anastasia has trained herself to cope with the pain. I can think of better ways of dealing with pain. Yeah, like when you eat a cold ice cream and you get a brain freeze. Uh, not exactly, Zand. She's got a real skill. Now that's amazing. To treat a bruised foot, you just do something very simple. Put something cold on it to relieve the pain and reduce the swelling. How's that? That's great. Good enough to play football on? Oh, we forgot the football. Bother. How does he do that? So, to treat a bruised foot, put something cold on it. But if you're worried, tell an adult. <laughs> Time to see how Max is getting on. Let's head back to accident and emergency. Back in Manchester, eight-year-old Max has returned to hospital for an allergy test after his lip swelled up like this. Wow, it was a whopper. Max had been to school, then swimming, and then had dinner at home. But all of a sudden, his lips started to swell up like a big balloon. So this is what you look like normally but the cause of his mega mouth is still a bit of a mystery. Max is allergic to peanuts and white fish, but he hadn't eaten either of those things that day. However, Max has a theory. Uh-oh, Mum's in trouble. Mum said she was eating nuts, <laughs> and she touched me there on my face. <laughs> I might have to hold my hands up to that because I do eat nuts at home, but we do keep them out of his way. Well, it could be his mum, but it could also be something new. Enter allergy specialist Nurse Sarah Allard. And gosh, she's a terrible speller. No, Zand, she's putting a variety of allergy samples onto Max's arm to see which ones get a reaction. And it's not just food types. This is dog. She's also testing for things in the environment, including dogs, cats, grass and tree pollen. Hold on. Now Max just has to wait. The best thing to do for itches is to blow. It takes 15 minutes for the reaction to show up. A white bump shows there's an allergy. Wow, we've certainly got a few there. So our tests today have said, yes, you're still allergic to white fish and peanut. But what we've also learned today is that you are allergic to cats. So was Max playing with cats on the day his lips swelled up? Uh, no. And you are allergic to grass. Oh, was he rolling around like I do when I'm allowed? No, Zand, he wasn't so we're still none the wiser about why his lip grew so big. Well, Max still has his theory. I think it was mum. <laughs> your mum? That's nuts. Well, we'll never know. But you can put your arm away now, Max. Bye. 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 Ouch. Your body can need mending in all sorts of ways, and we're going to meet some special teams that are trained to fix you. <laughs> Speaking is one of the most complicated things you can do. And while I bet you know that your lips and tongue and voice box are all involved, I bet you don't know what your soft palate does or even where it is. Well, open your mouth and say ah. Uh, see that? 
it's where the dangly bit hangs from. And most of us use it without even thinking about it. But today, we're going to meet a patient who's learning to use hers. Nine-year-old Millie is in speech therapy after she was born with a cleft palate. This means she had a hole going through the roof of her mouth to her nose. She's had a series of operations to fix this. However, Millie still finds speaking a little bit difficult. There are some sounds that you find really easy and some sounds that you find difficult. And I find the S word more difficult than other words. And that's, that's the one you've been working on today, isn't it? Yeah. When you make a speech sound like an S, the soft palate needs to lift up and make a seal with the back of the throat. In Millie's case, she isn't able to do that. So when air comes up, it isn't directed just into her mouth, it also escapes down her nose as well. To help her with that, she's working with speech therapist Jane O'Connell. Today I've joined the class and Jane's set us a challenge. I've got to make up a sentence for each of these words. And then I'll be better than you. <laughs> I might use powerful adjectives as well. Oh, you might use powerful adjectives? Yeah. I don't think I know any powerful adjectives. <laughs> so. My dad showed um, the word to make a door. My dad sawed the word to make a door. Good sentence. Now it's my turn. Uh, I saw the sun shining in the sky. No, what I saw. What is Millie's having none of it. So I can't say I saw the sun. No. No, I meant like I saw the sun. No, that doesn't work. Does it? Well, you tried. I think I need my homework more than Millie. <laughs> there are other sounds that most of us take for granted, but again, our bodies have to do more than you'd think. Make a mmm sound for me. Mmm. Okay, what happens if I hold your nose? Listen to what happens to mm. that sound. The. Oh, I can't. I can't do it. No. What would normally happen is the air would come down your nose, but because I'm holding your nose, I'm blocking the air from coming down. And it actually turns that sound into almost a b sound. So try that at home. Make a mmm sound. And the mmm sound is a nasal sound where the air does have to come out your nose. And if you block your nose, mm, mm, you can't make the sound, so it becomes a b as the air escapes. So the really difficult thing that Millie's having to learn is to consciously control muscles that most people don't even know exist, like the muscles at the top and the back of your mouth. And so that is quite a skill to master. Before we finish, Millie's got her own speaking challenge for me. OK, so I've got to say red lorry and yellow lorry. That's fast. Fast. <laughs> red lorry, yellow lorry. Red lorry, yellow lorry. Red... Oh, I can't do it. <laughs> oh, she beat me again. Good luck, Millie. In accident and emergency, the team are ready to fix our next patient. Let's meet him. In Manchester, seven-year-old Ryan is in hospital with a hole in his head. I was spinning around on my bike and I fell off it and whopped my head. Holy moly, you did! So how on earth did this happen? Ryan was on his bike, riding along. Oh dear, no helmet. But his brother fancied a ride on it. Can I have a go? OK. So Ryan span his bike around with a nifty 360 degree turn. Only as he was spinning, he fell off. He went flying through the air and landed with the handlebar smacking him square between the eyes. Ouch. <laughs> It kind of hurts a bit. Just a bit? Crikey, you're brave. Anyway, let's get that gaping gash seen to. Enter Dr Jonathan Taylor. How did you fall? Do you remember? A handlebar. It didn't have no rubber on it and I want a head. So has the, the end of the handlebar gone into your head? Ouch. That's what I said. It must have hurt a lot. It did. Oh, can you tell me if it's too sore? Of course not. This is one tough guy we've got here. But because he wasn't wearing a helmet, he's had a blow to the head. Dr Jonathan needs to give Ryan a thorough checkover. Can I get you to do a few few little things with your face? Pull some funny faces for me. Make sure you... <laughs> Very good. Hang on, Ryan. The test hasn't started yet. I just want to make sure that all his, all his nerves in his face are, are working fine, that he's not got any injuries to them. Can you feel me touching you there? Mm -hmm. Also just making sure that he's sort of obeying commands and stuff so he's not had a serious head injury. Can I get you to screw your eyes tightly shut? 
very good. Unopened them very wide like that. Are you scared? Very <laughs> good. Looks like he's had a lucky escape. He's very brave in these situations when I've got to take him to hospital. Always calm, cool. He's been here before. He must be accident prone. Because this is quite near to your eyes, I think we might need to put a little stitch in there. To make sure Ryan doesn't feel any pain, Dr Nandini Sen arrives to give him some laughing gas. <laughs> and just like Mason earlier, with Ryan giggling away, the doctors can get to work. First up, they give his wound a good clean. And then they inject an anaesthetic to numb the area. Baby is laughing, you're not meant to laugh. And now the stitching can begin. It only takes two stitches to close up Ryan's wound. Did that hurt? No? Even his cut smiling. And once he's checked out the doctor's handiwork, this action hero is ready to go home. Yeah, yeah. Never mind the muscles, Ryan. On your bike. Let's hope we don't see you back here soon. Bye! Bye. An ordinary boxing club. With ordinary people working out. This man's hard at it. Is he a boxer? No, Zond. Is he a wrestler? He certainly is. Ooh, he looks very angry. Hang on a minute. Why is he sitting down? He's getting ready to rumble! Meet Alan Nasty Nash, and he's the world champion toe wrestler. It's just like arm wrestling, but with your toes. You have to lock toes and then push your opponent's foot to the side. Alan's so good at it, he's won the world title eight times. Do you have to pull that face when you're toe wrestling? What an amazing feat! How does he do it? Alan's mighty moves aren't just down to his twinkling toes. His strength comes from his legs. Alan trains at the gym three times a week to build up the massive muscles. Grr, there's that mean face again. Power is then transferred into Alan's short, stumpy toes. Hey! Through his massive flexor hallucis longus, that's the big toe muscle to you and me, which runs from his calf, down his ankle, and into the big toe. With all that power, Alan's toes take a real battering in matches. Over the years, he's broken nine of them. It's a dangerous sport, so best not try it yourself. I've had an injury that was so bad, I had to have the toe taken off, the bone ground down, and then the toe put back on again. What? If I had to have the toe taken off, the bone ground down, and then the toe put back on again. That's what I thought he said. Loser! That's amazing. In fact, there's a whole range of medical conditions that can be detected on your breath but not by us, even though we're doctors. Not by specialist medical researchers, not even by complicated equipment. That's why Daisy is here. She's a specially trained smell dog tour. Daisy's been trained by Claire to detect serious illnesses like cancer in a person's breath. So Claire, how does Daisy do it? Well, when people are unwell, they smell different. So some people have kindly donated their breath samples onto this tube. So they breathe in that and then the, the smelly molecules in their breath stick inside this sponge here. Absolutely. And then what we do is, in training, we show this sponge to Daisy and we've been able to train her to tell us if somebody has a very serious disease. Time to see Daisy in action. Now, we've laid out three samples of breath here. And one of the samples is from a patient with a serious illness. Now, the one from the patient with the illness... Chris! You can't say in front of Daisy. She'll hear. She's going to find it herself. Son, she's a dog. She doesn't speak English. It's sample A. Now, Claire, should we set off Daisy and see if she can find it? Daisy, seek, seek. She's done it. And unbelievably, it took her just six seconds. That's amazing. There was no debate. There was no. She didn't even have to check one of the samples. Yeah, she yeah. knew. As soon as she smelt that odour, she sits down and tells us she's found it. So while Daisy is special, she's not actually got any more smell receptors than any other dog. Take Sooty and Spike here. Although they might be better at sniffing out where their ball is than detecting illness, inside their noses they have 220 million smell receptors, whereas we only have 5 million. 
And there are other dogs like Daisy who've been trained to sniff out different medical conditions. So if someone has diabetes, for instance, and they have the wrong level of sugar in their blood, the dog could actually detect that and warn them to take their medication. So although your breath can sometimes smell bad, its smell can also reveal vital information about your health. Claire, that was brilliant. Thank you so yeah, much for coming in. And Daisy, you did such a good job. You understand, don't you? A cryogenic chamber is a freezing cold room used to treat common health conditions and help top athletes recover from injury, helping to repair their muscles. But today, I'm using it to find out how our bodies react in extreme cold. That room is minus 60 degrees, and the room behind me is minus 135 degrees. That's five times colder than the coldest day ever recorded in the UK. What's it going to feel like? Chilly. <laughs> this is Renate Zajay, and she'll be monitoring me to keep me safe when I'm in the cryogenic chamber. So clearly I'm going to need a very warm coat to go in there. No, just very, very small clothes, not very warm clothes. This is it? This is all I get? This is only that. Perfect. What do I mean, perfect? This doesn't look like nearly enough clothes. I might be cold, but at least I'm going to look stylish. Headband, vest, shorts, two pairs of socks, clogs, face mask, gloves. I told you I'd be looking good. So I've got James with me filming, but James can't come in with that camera. So I've got a special camera with me, which I can take in there. So I'm not going alone. You're coming with me. Here we go. And it'll be so cold in there that I need the face mask to stop my snot and saliva from freezing. Whoa. Oh. Oh. OK. It's very... It is very cold but it's quite manageable because it's very dry. It's also very, it's, it's almost sort of foggy in here. So the room I'm in at the moment is as cold as the coldest temperature ever recorded on Earth. But this room is just preparing my body for the next room, which is twice as cold. Minus 135, here I come. Oh. OK. Um. It's so cold in here that I can only stay in for three minutes, and Renate will be monitoring me the whole time to make sure I'm safe. It's very hard to describe quite how cold this is. The closer I get to the floor, oh, 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 this is now very, very, very cold. It's very hard to think it's so cold, actually. The shock to my body is making it hard to control my breathing. I'm getting goosebumps all over my arm, and you can see every single hair on my arm is standing straight up. And the reason that's happening is that my body is trying to trap a layer of air very close to my skin and uh, I'm shaking a lot. Shivering like this is my body getting my muscles moving to generate heat and keep me warm. As my hand gets cold, you can see all the blood goes out of my skin and now my fingertips are going absolutely white. Very, very cold indeed. That's because as my body gets colder, it's making a choice. It's taking the blood away from the parts of my body it can do without, like my fingers and toes, and putting it into the center of my body to keep vital organs like my heart and brain alive. I'm now coming up to almost three minutes. I will be very pleased to come out. Oh. 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 <laughs> That's so much better. This is like walking into an oven. But when you're cold, you get goosebumps, and that's your skin trying to trap a layer of warm air around your body. So what you can see from that is how important your skin is in regulating your body temperature. And when you get extremely cold, your body starts making choices about what it wants to keep going. Very, very, very quickly, my body takes the warm blood from my skin, brings it into the middle of my body to keep my organs warm, my brain going, all of these things. When I come out into the warm, my body immediately releases that blood and you can see it all going to my skin. And there's a very good reason why our bodies react like this in the cold. My core body temperature, that's the temperature in the middle of my body, had dropped by even four degrees. It could have been fatal. What's so interesting about being in a room that cold is that you can see all the incredible things your body does to keep you at exactly the right temperature. 